to be. I hope that today's lesson helps equip you to have more victories in the name of Jesus. We mentioned last week that it's important to work on ourselves, foremost and always. But we're going to follow up with that today and have a review because there are times we simply need a refresher course in God's armor. And as was mentioned by Larry in prayer and Jason as well, uh, the terms of building our faith. Today I also want to, yes, do that, but also protect what you have as well. So I want you to enjoy this week's devotional lessons on, from the His Family Devo book on how God's people, His redeemed children, are His army for righteousness as well. We are soldiers for righteousness in His spiritual army. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 teaches that we are to get our minds ready for battle. Get ready for battle because we are in a spiritual warfare and we want to win it. We can't help the fact that we exist, we're on this planet Earth, and we are in this spiritual warfare. I might as well choose to be on the winning side. Let's not think for a moment that there's not a day or an hour that goes by where Satan's darts or flaming missiles are not directed on us. He's targeting us because we have something he hates and that we can conquer him with. The doomed devil does not want you to enjoy the blessings of God. The doomed devil wants you to share in his fate. That's why he will want to destroy and disrupt your faith. And according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, appreciate the references to Hebrews earlier, it's impossible to please God without faith and trust in him. He's given us every reason to trust him. Faith is walking by that trust, things that we do not see or understand. But Romans 5, 2 lets us know that it's by faith, our faith, that accesses all the blessings of God that are in Christ. Everything that he has done, all the blessings he has to give, and he's eager to do so, we access that by grace through his faith. Faith through grace. So, for salvation's sake, for righteousness' sake, we're warning to hold on, keep growing, and guarding and strengthening our Bible-based faith. Satan can't take away your faith, so he will do his best to uh, mess it up or encourage you to give it up. And the one way he does this, one of the key ways he does this, is encouraging you in the field of temptations. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 says that all temptations are rooted in just three categories. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. There isn't a single one of us that has not succumbed to those categories of temptation. Of course, the devil customizes those based on what he knows about us. So basic and yet so powerful because we've all succumbed to them accountably. And he customizes them in hopes that we get hooked and ultimately lead to our demise. He has no good intentions for you. And that's why we need to choose the Lord's side. So these are the battles that I hope this lesson today helps equip you to overcome more often. Face those temptations when they come your way, and conquer them. We pray to avoid the temptations, but they will come when they do to conquer them in the name of Christ. I hope that you receive the encouragement through me as I have received from the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 12 as well. I love to think about how all of the heroes of faith that were prior mentioned in Hebrews 11, they are there, the martyrs of the faith, those heavenly uh, saints of old, are there cheering us on. They're saying, we've already sealed our fate. It wasn't easy for us. You can do it as well in the name of Christ. Colossians 3, 3 through 5, teaches that all the faithful, all the faithful will share in his glory. And that's why we must refuse sin. The temptation to sin, refuse it. Not a sin to be tempted, but refuse it in his name. Why is sin idolatry, as is taught by that verse? Because temptation presents an option, your will or God's will. That's where any sin is idolatry, because sin is preferring my will over God's. And Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 13, teaches that those who serve sin will be overcome by death, because God is the God of the living, there is no unrighteousness in Him, but sin separates our relationship with Him. So those who are living in the spirit of Christ, those are the ones that will be victorious in life. So again, I simply pray that this lesson helps fortify your faith as it grows, but you hold on to it 
and use it, use that shield of faith to deflect those flaming missiles of the evil one and win more battles over temptation for ultimate victory and in eternity. So let's prepare our minds for battle as we read and notice Ephesians chapter 6. Oh, I love this passage, and I know you do as well. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. My brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Don't leave a piece off that you may be able to stand. And the concept of standing and withstanding. Be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. That describes the battle we are in until the Lord returns. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. God wins. I want his armor. He provides it for us. I want to win with his very armor. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to, and there's the opposite, uh, uh, the further concept of standing, withstanding in the evil day. You're standing poised, you're in good stance, and you're in such a good firm stance that even attack will not shake you. Having done all to stand, be victorious. Verse 14, stand therefore. Because of all this, you stand, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming darts or fiery darts or missiles of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We must suit up in God's armor. We must be trained in how to use it. Because the deceiver does not want you to study the word. That's how you can defeat him. And he would rather that be your fate. So here are some spiritual strategies to practice every day. Never take for granted. Practice in rehearsal. Practice makes better. And we're using the perfect armor that God himself wins with. So number one, we'll spend more time on this one, of course. Spiritual strategy to overcome temptation and win against the devil in many ways. Give up. Huh? Give up. Like so many heroes of faith who were called to do things beyond their means, faithfulness is what we're called to do, and faithfulness will allow us, and it will take us across the battlefields in which opposition will be encountered by forces too great for us. Ephesians 6, 12 lets us know we are battling against forces too strong for us, but not for God. I appreciate the young man David in the account of 1 Samuel 17. He, in the name of God, stood boldly in the presence of the Philistine giant Goliath. And he understood in all of this, regardless of the outcome, but he had faith to do what was right. He gave credit to God because God was the one who gave the victory and he gave credit where it's due. It wasn't just like saying, okay, well, God, thanks for watching. Appreciate it. I'll give credit to you. No, he says, because of you. And we'll reference that later. Romans 8, 31. I look at that victory in the name of Jesus over a giant, and I look at the enemy that was too great for us in the context of Romans 8. The victory over sin and death. Verse 31 ends with a passage that Lucian shared last Thursday morning as well in class. Uh, if God be for us, who can be against us? I'll quickly reference 1 John. Every chapter is so good and references this idea in so many ways, but chapter 2 and chapter 4 and 5 specifically deal with we have victory in two ways. We have forgiveness of sin. Who could have thought that? We have forgiveness of sin, and we have victory over temptation. The twofold victory there. As we walk in him. He always talks about walking in the light. John does. Walking in the light. I love that passage. 
as a Christian, as a citizen of heaven on earth, we're in this battle. I prefer to be on the winning side. And if he has gained the victory and only he assures the victory, and if it's in his strength that is uh, the glory shared, I'll give up the foolish notion that I can defeat the devil on my own. Forget that. Just forget it. I deserve nothing except that I have faith in Christ who strengthens me. So I will fully surrender to God whose help with me offered in every battle helps me stay faithful and overcome temptation. Perfect? No. Victory? Yes. This is a beautiful promise that I'm referring to in Hebrews 2. If you like this passage as much as I do, then you're there. If not, then this may become one of your favorites. And I appreciate the references earlier by uh, the communion comments. Jeremy made some great comments today, uh, as always does. And let some of those comments echo in your mind about the torn veil as I even read this and explain a few things as I go. Hebrews 2, verse 14, beginning. Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. Okay. I love the word, I love the prose, the way it's worded. Our experience as a human is now something, is a level of fellowship that now we have with the word, or I should say now that the word has with us, because he, the word of God, came in flesh as the Messiah to atone for our sin. God can now relate to us in this way experientially. He knows what it's like. That though, that through death, his death, Jesus may destroy might, that is, will destroy him who had the power of death, and that is the devil. Because the devil tempts to sin, he has the power of death. And the consequence for, for centuries, millennia, this has been the enemy. What's going to be the case? How do we conquer this? Well, verse 15, he can now release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to this bondage. Verse 16, for indeed... He does not give, Jesus does not give his aid to angels. This isn't the necessary role that they require. But he does, Jesus does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Who's the seed of Abraham? Those by faith. Faith in who? Christ. Those in Christ are the seed of Abraham. Those in Christ are children of Abraham. Christians are spiritual Israel. The church is spiritual Israel. He gives aid to his church. And in the context of doctrine, in the context of practice, look at verse 17. Wow. Therefore, in all these things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. In things pertaining to God. Priest? High priest? What were the comments Jeremy made earlier about the uh, ability or right he had to approach from the earthly to the spiritual and to approach God's throne? Priests were also, in different spots of the temple grounds, were offering sacrifices for sin and for the people. Our high priest is to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Jesus Christ, God in flesh, is able to enter the holy of holies and pay our penalty. Verse 18, for in that he himself had suffered, though sinless, being tempted, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. And he does. I believe Steve referenced many concepts today in his morning class that echo what we will be discussing in just a few moments. But starting with 1 Corinthians 10, 13, promises that he will provide a way of escape. We've just got to look for it. Point one, give up. Point two. Walk in the presence of God. Walk in God's presence. And because of the shaded background, pen ink may not work as well as pencil ink. I know this. I remember this later after I printed. I wasn't going to waste any paper. I remember that. But feel free to write above or below it. This is so important. Walk in God's presence. Because, it's like the song says, temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee every hour. This is one of the reasons Christians pray. Ephesians 6.13, read earlier, lets us know to suit up in God's armor before we step on that battlefield. But before we take one step onto it, we better pray. Don't enter another step. Don't take another step before you pray in verse 18. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. 
Luke 11, 4, the prayer is, do not lead us into temptation, but then he also includes, deliver us from the evil one in that way as well when it comes our way. God, I need you with me every day, today, every hour. Temptations lose their power in your presence. Number three, give thanks. Give thanks. I'll speak intentionally. I do not want to miss words, so I will, I will speak slowly on this point. Some of you may want to take a note on this. Why give thanks in the concepts of temptation? Because a grateful spirit fuels divine contentment. And that keeps our stance balanced. There's a lot of pressures. And the devil tempts us with those desires, whatever we do or don't have or think we do or don't. So gratitude keeps us balanced. And it prevents numerous temptations to sin that either are rooted in things that help us or tend to make us think higher or less of ourselves, whether it be pity or selfishness or greed, whatever. So count your blessings, stay appreciative, and stay strong in the fight. Number four, be conscious of God's word. Conscious contact through God's word is how I think I worded that. Yes, contact through God's word. Stay in the word. Matthew chapter four, we see Jesus himself using the word to defeat the deceiver. The, the devil knows scripture. He just rejects all of it. The devil knows it. He can even take it and twist it for his, his devious purposes. But the Lord quotes it accurately and keeps it in proper context for proper application and holy benefit. That's how we need to be. Lest we shy away from the word that can save our soul, we need to go to it to understand it properly. And I love this next idea. I'm, uh, how do we suit up in God's armor and be victorious? I'll display these verses. You can screenshot them now or later. And they, this will be a fun study. We, we've had it before in a class setting. This here shows you with verse references how every piece of the armor, every piece, goes back to the truth of God's word. It's rooted in the word. The sword, the belt, the breastplate, the shoes, the shield, the helmet, every bit of it is rooted in the word and the truth of God. So the best attested work of antiquity, we call it the Bible. We say it's the best attested work of antiquity because of God's sovereignty. Only God could work the way he did to make sure that the will he gave to people initially would be conveyed to us, conveyed, so that we would have everything we need for righteousness and godly living. And with something as important as our soul's salvation, if God would not preserve his word for that cause, the God in the Bible would have not been accurately described anyway as loving, compassionate, and merciful. But we have his will for righteous living, and that is what we need to suit up with. To conquer evil, we must be skilled in the word of righteousness. This comes down to good study and putting it into practice for good living. So be encouraged by this. Number five, pack the right bags. I asked last week, how do we minimize the frequency of temptation? How do we even uh, minimize the intensity, the frequency and intensity of temptation itself? Romans 13 verse 14 says, make no provision for the sins of the flesh. This word picture implies packing for a trip. Eternity is ahead of all of us with one of two destinations, either with God or not with God. And so heaven with God is the preferable uh, dwelling, okay? With that being the case, faithfulness is paramount. So take what will help you, discard what will hinder you. It's a simple principle, easier said than done, but it's a discipline. Hebrews 12 verses 1 through 2 parallels faithfulness to a race. I like this concept of a runner's race or a marathon in this case. We signed up for this when we put on Christ in baptism. And we're going to run this race no matter how treacherous or hard the battlefield is. 2 Peter chapter, five, verse, uh, verse, chapter 1 verses 5 through 11 says, Be diligent to make your calling and election sure. Be diligent for that. I want to know. Wherever I am in the future or wherever you are in the future, I mean, as, as paths go, people, I want to know that you're making your election sure. Be diligent. 
So he says, lay aside, cast off, get rid of every weight and every sin that hinders. Run with endurance the race that is before us, keeping your eyes on Jesus. Jesus himself kept his eye on the prize of having you with him. That's how he endured the cross. So he wants to give you that victory as well. Number six, Jesus was stunningly clear about this in Matthew 5, Matthew 5, 29 through 30. And you know the passage. Let me just ask you, did the devil sneak some things into your luggage that won't allow you to catch your flight? Get rid of those things. Cut it off, cast it out, get rid of it. If it disrupts your focus, hinders your journey, just, just don't carry it with you. Uh, what we have ahead of us is too great. It's too great to miss for anything here. So consider those things that lead to temptation and just don't make provision for them. Along that same note, point seven, find a fellow traveler who will inspect your bags. <laughs> find a fellow traveler. Ecclesiastes chapter four, verses nine through 12 say, two are better than one. Though other passages basically teach that they have more success in their labor. They have greater comfort and better protection against attack. And when they are attacked, they have help when they fall. God's blueprint for Christian living includes spiritual siblings to help one another along life's journey. One of the tremendous resources that God provides for his body to be faithful is the fellow members within that body. That's the way it should be. And that's the way it is, if we're all in the right. Decide right now, decide right now to seek that blessing among the brethren, build those relationships, and commit to being that blessing for your brethren. Number eight, bring the inside out. James chapter 5, verse 16 commands this. We know the devil works in this world. He sometimes works through uh, believers. We understand that too. So you have to be wise. And this passage instructs us to share our struggles because of the benefit that comes from our confessions and our brethren's prayers. The benefit. We sometimes don't get those benefits because we don't obey the commands. We're not doing in the process what we ought to build those relationships for those times. When temptations threaten your faith, when trials attack your endurance, call on those trustworthy brethren whose prayers and whose counsel can reduce the intensity of temptation, illuminate the right path, and increase your motivation to walk it. And by the way, the brethren's prayers can also help heal the weakness that led to those temptations as well. That's so encouraging. Take heart from this. Each of these points could have been its own lesson, but we're going through quickly here. My number nine, number nine, acts of service and love. That blesses the body immensely. Last week, I made a reference again to Tabitha or Dorcas, the acts of service and love. They missed her so much that they had the apostles bring her back to life. We won't come close to experiencing the spiritual blessings that she did if we never get to work with what we have to help others. Number 10, do the next right thing. Just do the next right thing. Don't be overwhelmed by a faithful life. A faithful Christian life ahead of you seems daunting if everything else was behind you. But just do the next right thing. Christianity is a one-step at a time proposition in life, lifeline, uh, lifestyle, one step at a time. Just keep righteousness first and do the next right thing. Victory over temptation comes in two ways or two stages. Number one, you resisted. Congratulations. That's victory. You resisted. Victory number two is in the next category, and it happens over time. Your heart's being refined, and the things that once tempted you maybe no longer do. We're, well, we're going to be human until we no longer are, but, but you're overcoming temptation. Satan keeps trying, so we need to keep growing. Use these spiritual tools and watch God accomplish spiritual wonders in your life. I thought about concluding today with the reading of this dramatized summary of David and Goliath. 
I'm glad I provided it for you. I just chose to uh, focus more on the teaching than the reading of this great account. But in summary, those who relied on their own strength weren't even going to fight Goliath. But David relied on God, God who was with him in the whole process. Who killed Goliath? We might say David did because David chose to fight. David chose to sling. David chose the stone and when to let go. David chose to take that moment and use his own sword to take care of the final blow. But who did David himself say deserves the credit? Not as God was the watcher and cheer on. Thanks for cheering me on, God. No. David himself said that God made all this happen. 1 Samuel 17 verse 46 David promised the Philistine in advance, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And then he specifically cries out, for the battle is the Lord's and he will deliver you into my hand. Wow. David gave God credit because the battle was hopeless without God's aid. That's the key in the the parallel point. Likewise, the key to being victorious over our sin is to rely on his strength. Rely on his strength, not yours. You've already proven that you can't resist the devil. We need to rely on his strength. God help us in this moment. His wisdom, his power. 2 Corinthians 12 tells us to be humble and wise by just acknowledging our weakness. Don't let pride get in the way. Look at God, what I did. Don't don't let the devil, don't, uh, let's see. Lose one battle, or let's see, win one battle and lose the next one. Lord, here's my weakness. Hebrews 4 teaches that we draw near to our high priest, and he grants us grace in our time of need. That's what we need. That's what we need every day of our lives as we obediently walk in him. I mentioned before that we walk in the shoes of obedience on the foundation of grace. And I'm thankful that Jesus Christ is our mediator Jeremy referenced that when we go to our high priest or on that day, he professes us to the Father. In him, we have no sin. This is one of my children. Praise God for the victory he provides. The question is, have you won the victory over sin? Full dependence solicits his wonder-working power in your life. And if you have not yet responded in faith, in his name, to be baptized, as the scriptures say, for him to do his wonder-working power and forgive your soul, regenerate your spirit, to rise to walk in newness of life. Uh, Our invitation song, I encourage you, yes, come as you are, but remember this, it's by his power, it's by his grace, that we are translated into the kingdom and have righteousness that he owns imputed to us as we then begin a journey, daily maturing to conquer temptation. I've, encouraged, I've been encouraged studying for this lesson, and I hope it's encouraged you to build and protect your faith. Have victories in the name of Christ. If you're not in Christ, you don't have the blessing yet of this security of daily continual forgiveness as you walk in Him. If you need to put Him on in baptism, let's make that happen. Come as we stand and as we sing.